Uh, this forum has been going on since 2018. So for a couple of years, we've held it at hotels, been a really great event, have brought on some great panelists in the past and had some really nice intimate conversations when we've broken into small groups. So we're trying to do both jobs of like speaking about things really broadly with our panelists, but also making sure that folks are leaving with tangible takeaways in their small groups, um, just to make it more accessible, to make it less scary. I always feel like a huge barrier to these kind of talks is people feel like they need to be really educated or have some degree or have some, you know, more official standing to speak on these issues when really they're about your personal life, your personal history, uh, and things you do and see every day. So it's nice to just shed that feeling that you need to be some credentialed doctor, although we do have a doctor on the panel today. Um, so yeah, if you can just leave that feeling at the door and when we break out into small groups, you know, we're, we're sharing, you know, you're opting in to share about your personal life and about how you've kind of grown up to understand gender and gender expression and all that. So just wanted to give that kind of disclaimer. So yeah, um, I will now let each of the three panelists introduce themselves and we can start with uh, Dr. Gary Barker. You can just give a quick introduction, then we'll move to Greg and then to Emiliano. Sure, um, Justin, thanks. And Antoine, thanks for the invitation. I'm Gary Barker. I'm the director and co-founder of an NGO called Promundo. Um, I started the organization with colleagues in Brazil and then opened um, the US office, which is based in Washington, DC about 11 years ago. Um, I'm originally from Texas and I've been working on engaging men as allies in gender equality if, yeah, for 20 something years, but it doesn't mean I think I know a lot. I think we've tried a lot of things that don't work. Um, so I think there's a, there's a huge amount to learn and a, you know, a huge amount to do. And I'm both personally and, and professionally and as my cause for activism, um, yeah, this has been the field that I've, I've uh, tried to contribute and learn from a lot of folks, particularly um, some years of, of knowing the folks at SAFE and we've had a chance to learn from some of your approaches as well. So really pleased to be part of this conversation. And feeling safer today in Washington DC than we have been in the last few days for reasons that should be fairly obvious. Uh, some wacky Wednesdays this month. Hello guys, I'm Greg Galindo. Uh, I am the founder of Good Fight Fitness, which is a local fitness um, business driven to uh, promote health and wellness, especially in underserved areas. So I combine um, my fitness expertise with uh, services to local nonprofits and hosting camps, fitness camps in underserved areas um, in hopes of just promoting um, and educating wellness and health in, in areas that may not get it otherwise. Um, I am also a realtor with J.B. Goodwin and a hip hop artist that I say I am in socially conscious and spirit driven. So, um, so yeah, I do a lot of things. My mom says I'm um, undiagnosed ADD, which is probably very true. And, uh, and I've been volunteering with SAFE for several years now. I host an event called Night of Soul each year. Unfortunately, I couldn't do it this past year for the obvious reasons, uh, but I am hopeful we can bring it back in 21, which is just bringing musicians and artists together for a Night of Soul uh, while giving back to SAFE. So uh, very near and dear to my heart. Um, is safe. And thank you, Justin and Antoine, for leading this today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emiliano diaz -Ajon. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm the Men's Engagement Specialist with the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault. We are the Sexual Assault Coalition here in Texas. We represent all the rape crisis centers here in Texas, including SAFE. Um, I'm really happy to be with you this, this afternoon. I've been with TASA now uh, for 13 years. This is my 13th year at, at TASA as a men's engagement specialist. I work primarily with uh, rape crisis centers around the state around engaging men in sexual violence prevention and providing and enhancing services to male survivors of sexual violence. And so I'm originally from Austin, Texas. I actually got my start as a volunteer and um, soon after that as a children's advocate at SAFE. Um, so, it is a real honor uh, to be on uh, today's panel. I want to thank Safe Men for, for hosting today's panel and uh, just give a shout out to all the folks who are engaged in the work, especially volunteers and the staff at Safe, 
uh, who are on the front line every day providing services to victims and survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, dating violence, et cetera. So again, thank you so much for the work that you do every day. Uh, and again, really happy to be with you this afternoon. Great, thank you. And like Emiliano mentioned, so this event is put on by the Safe Men's Engagement Group. We call it MEG affectionately. Um, it's a coalition of safe volunteers, safe employees um, who have an interest in this kind of engagement work with the understanding that gender-based violence, domestic violence, sexual violence, all of these things are tied to an explicit imbalance in power and that it's absolutely key that men be involved in ending the violence that it's often men are the ones perpetrating. So that's kind of like what births this event. We meet um, every month about. If you'd like to join, you're welcome to place in the comments or message Antoine directly. I think you can do it in the Zoom chat. Um, he would be glad to get you set up with the invite to the next meeting. Um, and yeah, I always get the caveat talking about the safe men's group. I'm always, I want to be clear of like, we are a men's group. We are, we are not trying to assert that the men are harmed in an equal way that women are. And I think that sometimes is the connotation that people get when they hear like a men's group. Sometimes it's tied to like men's rights activism. And so I'd like to be clear about that. And that actually leads into the first question that I wanted to ask the panelists is, as we're trying to build a coalition of, of men that are critical of their behavior, critical of the way that maybe they are treating people in their life, particularly women, um, critical about the way that they're performing their own gender, I think we often come across folks that have difficulty kind of accepting the idea that in our society that it the sexism harms women more than men. And so the question I wanted to pose to the panelists is, how do you respond to someone that comes to you and says, you know, people always talk about sexism, they always talk about how things are hard for women, but my life is not easy. The women in my life expect me to be this way, like I'm, I'm harmed just as much, if not more so by these expectations. How do you respond to someone that's coming to you and saying that? Uh, I guess I'll start. I can initiate. Um, I, I think sometimes it's best to always respond to a question with a question. I've um, I noticed you get probably uh, more open ended uh, response that way. And so um, I would say things like um, or, or just pose a question um, to to a male friend or a colleague or what have you. Um, if there was a discussion with that topic in mind uh, of something as simple as, you know, would you trade places? Uh, with a woman for a day or or a week and i think a lot of times a common response without thinking about it would probably be no um and i think um you know that goes back to inequality of really any kind whether it be racial or gender or what have you i think a lot of times people um will defend whatever uh whatever perspective they're coming from based on just not experiencing the other side and so um i think a lot of times men kind of we, we're defensive right and um but when asked if you would trade places, I think the honest response for most men would probably be no, because um, I think we do realize uh, if we if we kind of let go of the pride factor that there is inequity and there is inequality, uh, and it's just always you know it's something that's that's um, it's been like that from the beginning of time in a lot of, and especially in Western culture, well in, in Eastern as well, but. Uh, but yeah, that would be my response is I would, I would ask that question. And I would also ask, you know, do you feel um, in your everyday life that you need to prove your worth? Are you insecure or, or unconfident when walking into your workplace? And most men would, I would, I would venture to say would respond no. Um, but if you pose that question to women, I think a lot of times you would get the response that yes, they do probably feel insecure or not as confident just based on the fact that they feel like they have to prove more. You know, you're already starting you know, from, from, you know, 20 yards back. Uh, and so, so that would be my, you know, response. I would just ask those questions and, and see where it would go from there. Definitely. Um, maybe I'll, I'll jump in there. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Greg's approach of, you know, going, going back with a question. Um, 
And I guess the other part is how to how to look at um, without using the you know within a within this group we can use the word patriarchy, but with you know how do we how do we start a conversation with with men that um, doesn't become so polarizing, where the conversation is say, says um, what do we all have to win with ending a system of power that both historically has placed given men more collective power um, compared to women, but has also separated men from parts of ourselves, keeps us from being connected, caring, nonviolent, full um, human beings. So I think trying to find that, that center of the Venn diagram to say, um, you know, maybe we'll, you know, there, there may be a, mo there is always a moment that we need to talk about the power and the inequality, but kind of to get men in the room, often a, the, a need to think about, let's talk about a moment just, you know, one of the ones that you brought up, Greg, I think we could use some other questions and say, where you felt fearful of other men, um, where you've experienced violence from them, because, you know, I, I don't think many of us get through, um, get through childhood without experiencing some violence or fear of other men, and to say, wow, how did that make you feel? What about something you wanted to do, but couldn't because you felt you were kind of stuck in this idea of people judging you if you were the kind of man they thought you should be? So, you know, think about that for a moment. I've not found a man who doesn't have, you know, a male identified individual who doesn't have one of those stories. And now say, hold on to that for a moment and let's talk about women. Um, how do you imagine, you know, how, how worried do they feel walking at night alone? How, how often have you been fearful that you would be raped? Or that if you said no about something sexually that somebody would try to continue um, regardless of what your wishes are? How many times have you looked at an audience in front of you and they were 90% didn't look like you um, and you had to feel like you belonged in that space? What do you think it feels like to run for Congress when only 20% of those faces in you know, our particular powerful house of, of, uh, of legislation doesn't look like you? And then we can, you know, then we can go on further around if you, you know, the, the, the amount, and then sometimes I'll, I'll make it lighthearted just to, to end on it is, we'll do some, some of the data around care work and who does what. Um, and that, you know, on average globally, women do about three times more in the US, it's about 1.4 times more than men do on an average basis. And then, and then men will say, yeah, but I work outside the home more. And then I'll show the numbers that say, actually, if you count working hours, either working in unpaid work at home and paid working hours, women work on average 30 minutes to an hour more than men do. Um, that is about, because men can do math, we've heard, that is about two weeks of Netflix binge watching for free that we get as men. And then let men sort of chuckle on that for a little bit around, you know, so that we can also bring in a bit of lightheartedness around the numbers here. You know, they don't, maybe I'm not that average. Maybe I'm doing more of the care work in my particular household if I live in a heterosexual household, let's say. Um, but those numbers globally have been around, as you were saying, Greg, for years and years. So I think using, you know, using a little bit of that, you know, our historical data and a little bit of um, what's at stake for men for believing in a, in a healthier, more connected, more equitable justice, um, justice in the sense of social justice and equality version of manhood. There does seem to be a common thread in any kind of power group that kind of knee jerk pearl clutching, pearl clutching of like, I'm not like, you think that my life is easy? You think that I don't have any problems like that seems to be the go to for a lot of groups in power, whether that's for class for race for for gender like that. So I, it is a tricky line to walk up like, how much do you concede to get them on your side? And how much do you like, hold your ground and say, No, this is how the world really is. This is how the inequality actually looks like. And I want you to be on this side, but I'm not going to like, give up too much ground to make that point. Yeah, thank you, Gary, Greg and Justin, uh, for sharing that. You know, at first I'd give them the side eye, right? And like, um, and then I would do what Greg was advocating for. I would listen, right? Um, I would ask questions and I would proceed to acknowledge that I too benefit from being a man, right? That there are benefits that, that come with, with being uh, presenting masculine. And I would talk about how difficult it is to relinquish those privileges. But in the process, like Gary talked about, I've also benefited um, in other ways, right? I've benefited emotionally. I've, I've benefited physically in terms of my physical health. 
uh, my mental health, my spiritual health, my sexual health, right? I have healthier, uh, consensual, loving sexual relationships, right? Um, and I think those are conversations of corazón, right? Heart to heart, corazón to corazón, like the, the kinds of conversations that we have with the men in our circle, right? The men in our lives that are, that are closest to us. Then I think there's, there's an opportunity there to follow up, right? Uh, I'm a huge advocate of, of books. I love books. I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of, of books related to this particular issue. The book for me that really was profound, that was given to me, and that I think is so useful for men, especially men of color, is uh, The Will to Change, uh, Men, Masculinity, and Love by Bell Hooks, right? This is, this is a profound book, right, that, that every, every man of color should read. It should be on our reading list. And I think when we engage, with, when, when we, we engage in those conversations, gift him these books. The other book that I think is really important is The Macho Paradox, right, by Jackson Katz. And I can't tell you how easy these two books are, right? Like you don't have to be, uh, have an academic background uh, to, to, to read and appreciate these books. But The Macho Paradox was, was extremely profound for me and had the kind of impact in terms of beginning to understand how I benefit from patriarchy how I benefit from sexism. Um, and, I, and I think those, the, these things are, these tools are critical, right? These are tools that we have to give to men. We, we know how to use tools, right? Um, and sometimes we just have to teach men that there are other tools, right? There, there are things that, that we need to pick up and read, whether it's an article, whether it's a, you know, a blog post, whether it's a podcast, whatever it is, that there's a the willingness on our part to follow up with, with some sort of tool, right? Here's how to apply that uh, to your life, uh, to, to your relationships with your partner, with your children, with your coworker, with your classmates, et cetera, right? So I, I think that's really critical um, and it's so easy for us to do. It's really non-threatening for me to shoot, you know, send you a book, right? Um, or to gift you a book, right? Uh, so, I really encourage folks to, to pick up and read these books. They're, they're so important. I can't tell you how, how much of an impact that's had on me in, in this particular question. Thank you. So Dr. Barker mentioned in his answer, the way that young boys and men kind of police each other and punish each other when they step out of line, whether that's how they're acting, how they're speaking, what activities they're choosing to do, who they're hanging around with. So I wanted to ask y'all, what motivates, what motivates the peer group to kind of become the police and to police each other on these behaviors? Like what is, what is the motivation there? And what is it that young boys and men are afraid of being seen as, um, as they're trying to navigate this really narrow lane? We did some, uh, some, some listening to, to parents and to young boys right kind of just before COVID lockdowns for a, um, for a study we were doing um, as a prelude to a study on what boys are watching on TV. And there was time and again, just how much when we asked boys without peers in the room or the younger boys kind of what manhood was, it was loaded with all kinds of positive things, being true to your words, supporting your friends, being loyal, being honest. It was a lot of words of integrity. Um, and, then, and then we, with some of the older boys, um, we asked, you know, what, what about those that we, we, we told them, hey, we heard from some younger guys, some eight, nine, 10 year olds this, and we asked 12 and 13, 14 year olds. And they said, oh, you can't show any of that stuff because the peer group will, you know, hold it against you. Um, you're, you know, you'll be judged if you do those things. And just this keen sense and awareness that the world, you know, divides us and creates hierarchies um, and judges you based on, you know, do you live up to that hierarchy? You know, we're winners and losers, we're red states or blue states, where um, our sports are about, you know, much of them are about who succeeds with the greatest fill it in. 
batting average, you know, score scoring yards run and the you know and fill it in, um, and and how little it's about doing it together. How much is about I win, I conquer. Um, so just a keen awareness, and and then we looked at what boys are watching on TV, um, and the roles of manhood that are portrayed there, and then look at you know from the toys and look at the, which is why even very very thoughtful parents you know, can't do it alone because we've got this world that says men do this, they look like this. We have 74 million folks in this election who voted for a man who did all that stuff or, you know, that, that he was, that he owned up to his locker room talk and all of that. Um, you know, so I think it's really, uh, as, as two-year-olds, <laughs> we become keenly aware of how power works. Um, and add to it, you know, I think this, we desire to connect and be, be loved and be liked. We want to be in social groups. And if the way to be in the social group is to be fill in the blank an asshole to use that word, um, we'll do it. And, and, you know, that's not a, we don't have to do a, a value judgment that those, you know, it's, it's evil actions or evil people, but it just, our desire to fit in is so, you know, it's so part of who we are as a social connected species. Um, so I think how, you know, helping, um, helping boys be aware of that, I think, is an, an amazing and necessary first step. And Emiliano, I think, you know, the two books that, that you hold up, I think, are great about thinking about how men, you know, kind of first step is just to be aware of this. Wow, of course, there's this world around me that, that tries to channel me in that direction. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered the why, but just, a, you know, I think that is, I think a first step in the journey is an awareness around this is the, this is the way that I'm trying to fit in and how much that pulls me away from what I think is my truer, better, more, not just more authentic, because authentic can be good or, you know, can be harmful or positive, but, but the way that I want to connect with others in relationships that are not based on harm to them or to myself. Um, so I think, I think it also helps us to reframe the work and say, we're not taking something away from men in the work, in these discussions, we're trying to let you be your better, truer um, human self. Um, that you, you know, that by being a part of a species that does care and connect and love and survived because we care for each other, um, I think helps people, you know, instead of feeling like we're taking something away from men to say, no, we're giving back to you the, the richness that, that you're entitled to as a human. Yeah, I think that awareness you're talking about includes the awareness of who's being stepped on to get to that point, right? It's, it's that fear of being seen as gay, as being seen as feminine. So I think that awareness, when you take that full 360 view, you realize this is who I'm kind of degrading to, to push myself farther away from them to be seen as more worthy, more masculine, more X, Y, Z that's achieved by stepping on and pushing away and devaluing feminine traits, feminine behavior, feminine appearance. And that oftentimes is you know, tied to so many isms and phobias. Yeah, thank you, Gary and Justin. Um, you know, at the root for me is, is the fear of violence. Right? To be honest, I, that, that fear still lingers with me as a middle-aged man. Like, it, I, I feel that in my gut right now. Um, and I wish, I wish I was as fearless as my son when I was 11 years old and in middle school. Uh, he has long hair. He's occasionally been confused for a girl. He wears pink with pride and embraces his nerdy, nerdiness without uh, shame. He also wholeheartedly believes that girls can do anything that boys can and make sure others know that, know that too. Right? So I wish I was like him. Um, I wish I had more models of that type of, of masculinity, right? And so I'm really looking for this week, right, for those examples. Uh, we need more examples of men like President Joe Biden, right, who has shown empathy, right, who, who, is, who is grieving with us uh, during this time of COVID for the people, uh, that, the, the 400,000 individuals that we've lost in this country, right? Somebody that will, will cry, right, will show just any ounce of empathy for, for the Americans that we, we've lost uh, in this country. Um, the first gentleman, right, Doug 
you know, who enthusiastically supports Vice President Harris, right? That type of masculinity that stands and supports um, her leadership, right? Her position uh, in our country. Musicians come to mind like Bad Bunny, right? Harry Styles, right? Who are not musicians of my generation, but we're seeing these musicians uh, who blur the lines of masculinity in music and fashion, right? This shouldn't be an act of courage, but rather the norm, right? I want these things to be a norm. Uh, I wish they were the norm for me when I was coming up, but it, it's exciting to see that they're the norm for my son, that he doesn't <laughs> like, uh, that that's just sort of the expectation that we have of other boys and men. Um, and, and I'm trying to embrace that. I wanna be fearless like him and embrace those things um, and I honestly, it's still hard for me to, to let go of that mask, right? So I would encourage everybody, if you haven't already, to watch The Mask You Live In on Netflix, right? That really explores this issue of the mask and, and this, the, the way that we try to fit into the, 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 the act like a man box, right? The box that, that keeps us from being what Gary was talking about in terms of just being wonderful human beings, right? Be, being, being able to express a full range of emotions, being able to express our love um, and joy um, and pain and all of the things that, <clears throat> that I want to, that I want my son to, to experience uh, as a man. Um, so, you know, for me, this, it, it really is rooted in all of these things, and, but I think there's an opportunity there for us right now um, this conversation is just part of that. It's about what you do after this conversation. Uh, you share the recording with the boys and men in your life, right? You engage in this conversation after they've watched it. Um, those, th that's, how we, that's how we create change um, in, our, in, in our country, in our society, in the world. And so um, this, this particular time is very, in, like I, I feel very hopeful and very optimistic about where this conversation can go. Um, and, and I think you're an example, right? The folks who are watching this, think about the example that you're setting for the boys and men in your life, including the women on, on this, <clears throat> that are attending this, this forum. So I challenge us to think about all of these things, right? Uh, to explore all of these things further. I mean, this is just the start of, of a conversation, right? That I'm still having um, you know, as a, as a 45 year old man that I'm still having with other men that I need to have with other men that I have to have on an ongoing basis, right? So <clears throat> keep up that important work. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how much I can add to this conversation because you, uh, Emiliano and Gary um, expressed it and articulated it wonderfully. Um, that the one thing I will mention or express is that I've mentored young boys now for, gosh, going on probably 12 years uh, through a couple different local nonprofits here in town. Um, and it's just, a, it's been an amazing experience to see. And most of these kids were, um, uh, you know, coming from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, um, what you consider at risk youth, a lot of times just based on that, which, you know, is a, is a discussion for another time. Um, but what I've seen in, in the type of um, relationships they've that have evolved just with each other, these these kids that evolved with each other throughout experience and throughout uh, one of the groups uh, was with Explore Austin. If I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with that that nonprofit, but just a wonderful uh, local nonprofit that takes the urban inner city kids, both male and female. Of course, my group was uh, 15 boys that we started with, and we um, experience one week in the mountains together every year. And what we do throughout the course of the year during the school year is take them outside. So the whole, the whole um, curriculum with Explore Austin is taking these inner city and urban young men to places they may not otherwise go and, and give them experiences they may not, not otherwise have, rock climbing, mountain biking, um, rowing, uh, all kinds of different outdoor things that I, I didn't um, have growing up as well. And then it all culminates for one week in the summer of us going, going to the mountains and doing whatever activity that we, we've been practicing throughout the year. 
And so you've kind of had these, these hardened, you know, inner city kids that have grown up, which is, as you know, I did with this machismo, this, you know, we're tough, nothing can break us down. Uh, you know, we can't share feelings with each other. We're, we're all, you know, kind of, we're going to pick on each other and make fun of each other throughout. Uh, and this started with them in sixth grade and goes all the way through, through 12th grade. So I started with these boys in, in sixth grade. And, you know, the first couple of summers were a little rough getting to trust us as mentors and, and them getting to trust each other and, and be more vulnerable. And by year three, the, the evolution from them going to being, you know, tough and, and, you know, making sure they always showed that they were macho and in control to just full on telling each other how much they loved each other and, um, and being super vulnerable and emotional and crying around campfires. Uh, just opened my eyes to a world of changing the entire definition. We talked about that of what masculinity is and letting them know that you're more of a man than you've ever been for telling your brothers that you love them, for, for telling them that you needed them, for sharing, um, you know, a time when you were vulnerable. And uh, it just created this beautiful bond that we still have. These, these uh, guys have now, a lot of them have graduated college. Uh, we still touch base with each other on a weekly you know, basis. Um, a lot of them are in their careers now and they've had, they've had children and, and sons now of their own. And to know that they are now sharing those experiences with their, with their children, albeit male or female, is uh, just so, so um, pr I'm so proud that, to know that that has been something that God willing has now changed the course of their life and now creates that ripple effect uh, moving forward. And so uh, I just wanted to share that experience. I'm not sure if that answers the question at all, but we as, as men, like Emiliano said, we have to take what we, what we know to be true, which is that the, the historical definition of masculinity is, is wrong. Um, we don't always have to be the decision makers. We don't always have to be the strong ones. A matter of fact, it's probably better that we're not. Um, and we allow that space for others to make decisions and for others to show their strength and for us to be the listeners and us to be the compassionate and empathetic. And it, we, we then create a whole, a whole new world, God willing, for, our, for future generations. So, um, so yeah, thank you guys for your answers. Hopefully I contributed somewhat to that. Definitely. So I think we have time for one more question, but I wanna to get to it because it's kind of the theme of the whole forum. When we title this forum, power in relationships. And so I want to ask where, I mean, if you look at the numbers, obviously the reason SAFE exists is because it's an epidemic of violence committed in personal relationships between people that are dating, between strangers, between married couples. So my question is, where are boys and young men learning how to act in their personal relationships, in their sexual relationships? Where is that education coming from? And what is going wrong to kind of create this after effect of violence in personal relationships when they're older? And you can say porn. We're allowed to say the word porn on this. So if that's in your answer, you can say that. <laughs> um, maybe maybe I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I think... Um... You know, if if we could think about our own, we could think about our own experiences. I think about um, speaking with you know young men and boys about what do they see in porn, um, and you know I think the the first thing that we will that we will see often as men, and I definitely will not speak as all, but just what it creates this um, one this false idea that you know, women are all, if in the context of a heterosexual relationship and some gay porn presents this as well, that kind of the, you know, the other person is just always willing and interested and available at the drop of a hat, that male sexuality is this uncontrollable um, dominant force, that men are those who propose and expect acquiescence. Um, and that, you know, I think we're, we're not aware unless you step back from it and realize just how much the search engines are set up to give you more of what you clicked on and liked. I mean, it, it is it is very much the, you know, those experiments of, uh, you know, if, if you have a, a rat, you know, hooked up the, the, the lab mouse 
hooked up either to sugar water or some kind of addictive drug that they'll just keep pressing it, that this is the same logic that online porn is set up to do. So if you think about what it means to you and then to take a step back and say, and what about what's happening there in terms of what's consensual and the women involved in that industry, um, you know, I think to, to try to get conversations going and then to say, and how does it look compared to, you know, relationships you've had? Now, for those of us who have had real life relationships, we can make a contrast, but for a lot of young boys who haven't, they kind of, oh, it looks normal, um, which is very frightening. And I think um, Emily Rothman at Boston College who studies a lot in this, uh, launched a survey that came out, I think two weeks ago and found that, um, Older guys, so kind of young adult males, say they got a lot of information about what their part, you know, about sexual relationships by conversations with their partners, which is, I think, a good thing. Younger, so the kind of 15 to 18 year olds said porn was their first source of information more than real life conversations than potential or real partners. And so, you know, that that's a that's a frightening reality around um, how you know, this, this manipulative engine that, you know, drives us to buy products all the time and to vote for certain candidates and to get stuck in a circle of, you know, of harmful voting to say among other things is also being harnessed for how we think about our sexuality. Um, and so I think helping, you know, young men sort of feel a certain anger about that <laughs> and say, again, this is pushing me down a way of being that's not really who I want to be. And I loved how you said, Emiliano, around um, to have better, you know, emotionally connected, honest, intimate sexual relationships, I think is really an important developmental thing that we need our sons and daughters to feel like they get. Um, and at the same time, and here's the big but, and I would love to hear what the two of you say about it. There's a lot of healthy things that boys and girls can learn with erotic information. Um, because, you know, what they taught us back in third grade that kind of, as if all sex is reproduction, it's always heterosexual, it's always, it's, it's no pleasure in all prevention. Um, by, you know, I think by demonizing porn, we also kind of forget that there's a lot of more artistic, feminist, even thoughtfully done, mature, um, smart erotica that's produced that either couples want to use as part of their, you know, how they think about their sex lives or also for individuals. And I think so it is, how do we find a way that says, there's a lot of really positive things you're feeling watching some of that, but watch how you look at it. How do you, how can you become sort of an informed, I don't know what the right word is, user, consumer, lover, <laughs> who among the things that, that inspire you can be some kinds of, you know, erotic stimulus that comes from things you watch online or read or look at pictures of. That to me, I think is the, like the conversation that we need to figure out how we have with, and let's, let's be honest about the ages we have to do this with, with 10 and 11 year olds, if not before. Um, so yeah, <laughs> Greg and Milena would love your thoughts on it. Cause I think it is one of the, and it causes lots of fights in our field of kind of a complete, you know, throw it all out because it's all bad versus how can we be, you know, sex positive, healthy sexuality, pleasure, not just every conversation with sex assumes um, oppression, assumes that it's only, you know, conversations around disease prevention. Anybody in the audience who's got thought, you know, of the participants rather, who's got thoughts on that, I think that's one of our toughest conversations at the moment. You're right that it does often become a moralistic argument about sex and not about the content of what's being watched. So I appreciate you saying yeah. that. I was hoping you'd go, Greg. You're on, brother. You first. This is the fun topic. We're talking about sex now. This is like... Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is difficult, right? Because for me, that's, that's how, that's my ideas about sex and sexuality were informed primarily from pornography, not with, not having conversations with my mother. I was raised by a single mom. And so I never engaged in a healthy conversation about sex or sexuality or even sexual, like healthy sexual behavior, right? So I consumed a tremendous amount of porn. Porn was around everywhere in my, I grew up in the East Side 
it was in my home, it was on the street, it was at school. Um, and, the, and, and what I received was that sex equals violence, right? And most mainstream pornography that we consume uh, includes acts that are painful, that look, that are painful uh, for, for, for the people, uh, for the people in the, in the, in, in, in the videos or the, the productions. Uh, they're degrading, right? We have to acknowledge that they're also racist uh, that they're violent, right? And that's just mainstream pornography. That's the stuff that I've been consuming um, in my entire lifetime, right? Like that, 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 that boys and men are still consuming today. Um, you know, we learned that, that women are commodities, right? That can be bought and sold by men, right? And I, and I think that's unfortunate, right? All of these are, are, are really unfortunate and feed into human trafficking, sex trafficking, all of those issues are, are critical, should be part of our, our conversations, right? That we're having as men, right? They also create, at least for me, right? They created this unrealistic, risky, non-pleasurable ideas about heterosexual sex, right? And sexual activity, right? There was no, there was no, I, I didn't see models of, of consent. I didn't see models of pleasure. I didn't see models of healthy sexual activity, right? Uh, these unrealistic body types, right? Like that I didn't, when I looked at my body when I was a boy, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have, right? And, you know, so th th it creates a tremendous, at least for me, I'll speak for myself, it created a tremendous, and it still does, <laughs> it creates a tremendous amount of confusion um, and it impacts my sexual relationships. And I don't like, that has been the hardest issue for me to unpack and to, 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 to address in my own life, right? Um, I, you know, the, again, I, I go back to the book and I saw that Dr. Jensen is on here, but Robert, Robert Jensen's book called Getting Off was so critical and in, in, in informing and to helping me understand the impact that pornography was, not having, was having on me, but also ha having on the girls and women in my life, right? And, in, in our communities and in society in the world, right? And, and how to address it, right? Like I have to come back to this. This is another book that I, I think is so critical to this conversation that we, that we have to really explore and to be honest with ourselves and with each other um, and talk openly about it without shame and fear, right? I want to be able to have that conversation when my son is ready to have that conversation because he has access to he has access to the internet that I didn't have when I was his age, right? So, um, you know, I want to ensure that he has realistic, informed information. He understands that he he knows that he can come and talk to me. Has he come to talk to me about, uh, you know, puberty? No. Does he want to have the conversation about sex and sexual act sexual activity and uh, sexuality and all of? No, he's not ready. He he hasn't. He hasn't engaged me in that conversation, but he knows that when he is ready, we are ready to have that conversation with him. That we're going to provide him adequate um, information, right, uh, about whatever he wants to know, whatever he wants to know about sex, so that he's not his ideas about sex and sexuality are not informed by pornography the way that they were informed for me. Um, and I'm still trying to just like get those ideas out of my head, out of my body, um, out of my sexual relationship with my partner, right? Like those are, you know, this is, this is hard. It's a hard conversation, but I'm glad we're having it. And I wanna encourage folks to continue having this conversation with the boys and men in your life, with women too. I, I think it's important for us to live it, listen to women who have been, been impacted by pornography. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a great documentary on Netflix called Hot Girls, right? That helps us to engage again, to, to think critically that we can watch on our own or watch with a group of boys and men and have critical conversations about these things, right? Also balancing what Gary is saying, right? Thinking critically about what does a healthy sexual, like what does healthy sexuality look like, right? We want, I want that. I want that for ourselves. I want you know, I, I, I want to engage in that, in that thought. But unfortunately, what we have is this, this pornography that's really toxic and problematic uh, that we need to, to address. Um, so, yeah. Great. Thank you. 
Yeah, again, I, I'm not sure how much more I can add. I'll keep my, uh, I'll try to keep my answer as concise as, as possible because I think that, uh, that probably uh, Emiliano and, and Gary explained uh, it very well. Um, you know, I grew up in the mid 80s when, you know, the first exposure to pornography, I think was your, your friend's dad's Playboy magazine. You know, I think we all, we all had the, the, the friend that had a dad that had a stash and that was our first exposure. And uh, nowadays, you know, everything's at the click, literally of a, of a mouse or uh, of your fingertips. You know, you can get, you can see whatever images you want to see um, within, within seconds. And so we're going to have to approach pornography so much differently now in this age than we did, uh, you know, when I was a kid, because it wasn't just readily available. You know, you almost had to work a little bit maybe to get it, depending on, I guess, uh, your, your friend, your friend group, your social circle. Um, so, you know, growing up, I, now I have a 10 year old son and, you know, I know these discussions are going to have to happen so much sooner than they did when I was his age. Um, the, the education system, the way we learn about sex and health 101 is like you guys said, it's just so stiff, uh, no pun intended. Um, it's so it's, uh, it's lacking in, in any color. There's no color. Um, sorry, that bad joke. Uh, but yeah, we, we've got to we've got to change the way we talk to our sons and our daughters and our peers, and not make it this taboo, shameful, sinful act. Because it's it's probably the most natural thing as human beings, we we do, or one of the most natural things. Um, and so to strip away the, the the shame and the guilt. I mean, I think as kids, even hearing the word sex, there was an assumed guilt that you, you felt right away. And so uh, being able to, to speak openly and saying, hey, there's nothing wrong with it, dude. We all have these feelings. We all, we all experience lust, right? Like, I mean, that's something that's, again, it's natural. And so uh, I don't have the answers. I don't think I, any of us have just one answer, but to strip away the, the shame from having natural feelings of, of lust and desire and turning those into, into positives, that is, that is completely natural and okay. And now how do we express those from an empathetic and compassionate uh, point of view? How do we go about being able to articulate those, those physical feelings and, um, and make them now emotional? How do we, how do we provide that uh, same communication to our partners um, from an emotional standpoint? So um, you guys had amazing answers and uh, I think we have a lot of work to do, but we're starting we're starting it here, um, and God willing, we're bringing it to our workplaces and our peer circles, um, and our you know, and our social groups wherever we go. And being able to communicate is always the in anything we do is is the number one. Communicating with each other and being honest uh, with each other. So, yeah, thank you for the questions, Justin, and the answers, guys. Definitely, and y'all, all three of y'all have given us some great content to move into the small group discussion with. So I appreciate all of y'all giving great, well-informed, well-cited, pulling out books left and right, uh, answers to questions. So I really appreciate that.